Well, good morning, everyone. And uh, we're going to continue this study on Judges uh, chapter 10, uh, dealing with um, basically working into the story of Jephthah. But before we begin, can we have a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, <clears throat> we are grateful um, for all the times that we have uh, together um, in studying your word. We're thankful for uh, this morning, for the topic that you have given us, and for the blessings of the last few weeks of study and the things that we have learned. We pray, Lord, for this movement, and we ask, Lord, that as we study this line that it can give us more light about our responsibility to this movement and um, that you can guide us in what we should do. May your Holy Spirit speak to our hearts. May they be open. May our, our mind also be clear that we can clearly understand the things in your word and may you correct us when we are in error. Be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> okay, so as we um, were looking at at the end of the study on Thursday, we, we've been addressing this idea that uh, this story of Judges 10 and 11 and 12 are going to be covering once again uh, this period of time. And one of the things that uh, brought this to light was um, the 18 years of Judges chapter 10, verse 8. And those 18 years uh, bring us from September 11th, 2001 to September 11th, 2019. And the two events that are tied together there are um, uh, obviously September 11th with that date. And then we have, uh, what we have there is we have the closing of uh, the Lambert Church. And then we have, um, just going to put it up here so I can see this again. Um, and then we're going to have 490 days until they put up the school of the prophets for sale. So, so we can see that this, um, this 18 years is significant in that it's 18 years from the beginning of how we understand the book of Judges, marking from September 11th, 2001. And it's going to bring us to that date, this 18 years. And, and we can also see that there is a connection between the Lambert Church closing, being locked up, and also the School of the Prophets being placed for sale 490 days after that. Um, so I don't know, we didn't really have a drawing of that yet, but we probably will I'll put that on a line. We do have the sale of the School of the Prophets in, in um, a PowerPoint drawing. So that means that this story that we're going to be going to in the story of Jephthah is... Um, addressing the end of that period. So it's going to be addressing our history again, um, but in a different way. And that's what we will have to see, how we're going to put this on a line, because we've already studied these before. Um, now, we had these, uh, these five, this 5-2 combination of these gods, Right, so basically it's it's Balaam and Ashtaroth, that's the two, and then the gods of Syria, Zidon, Moab, Ammon, and the Philistines. And what would be the significance of the two and the five? How does that tie to our history? Anybody? 
everybody know? Because originally the two and the five comes from the, the seven years of famine when uh, Jacob uh, enters Egypt and there's, it's been two years in the famine and there's five, five years left. But how does that relate to our line? Where did we make an application of the two and the five? Were we looking at 2014 to 2020? No. So um, no, we weren't taking them as years. We were using it as a symbol. And, and the one who used it was, uh, I believe it was Stephen, um, in that he took the 777. Okay. Of course, related to the seven years, right? But this 777 period of time. Um. And then he saw that it could be divided as 252 and 525. And so he related that to the division of two and five. So if we're going to look at this um, as messages that need to be addressed in our history, that is, we've been oppressed, right, for these 18 years, and now we have this 777 structure. The 777 structure relates to uh, um, a message that God gives to undo this influence of these false gods that exist within this movement. Does that make sense? Could you elaborate a little bit more? Okay. So the reason God gave us this structure, the 777 structure, um, is for us to be reformed. Would we agree with that? that the yes. seven, yeah. So the 777 structure is something that was meant to be understood internally in God correcting this movement. And so the two and the five of these gods, this uh, structure, which we can relate to the 252 and the 525. And Stephen, it was you who, who created that structure, right? You recognize the structure of the 252 and the 525 related to the two and the five. Is that correct, Stephen? I don't hear you. Yeah. Okay. You and hear so, me? Yeah, I can hear you now. So, so the rationale there, because we were just talking about this, the two Balaam and Ashtoreth, and then the five cities, the gods of these five different um, uh, ethnic groups or whatever, that the, you had made the application of the 252 and the 525 based upon this from the story of Joseph of the two and the five, right? Of the famine, the two and the five years of the seven years of the famine. Is that correct? Yeah, that was part of it. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It, well, it also related to the idea of the 777 being divided as 342, 343 and 434, right? Um. Did you use that application yeah. that I had of that division, or is that just something that happened to align? Um, well, I think I was something yourself. Yeah, well, I know I did that, yeah. but I was wondering if, if you took that into account. With, uh, with Joseph? Well, not so much with Joseph, but just with the Lamech, uh, the two Lamechs, the study on the two Lamechs. Did that have an effect, or was that just... A coincidence. Oh, all right. Okay. Well, getting the seven, 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 then to the, the seventy weeks. Yeah. To get three to to get three twenty one. No, no. I'm uh, talking about just uh, where I where I took um, the center period of four hundred and thirty four years, and I took the two end periods and multiplied them 
together to get 343, and then I added them together to get 777. So I had the 777 days, or 777 as a symbol related to the 777 days. So, because I'd first figured that out in the story of Lamech, the 777 structure there, which was then would obviously relate to what you did with the 777, but you're saying you didn't take that into account or did you? Um, well, well, suppose that's how we get 777 connected with 70 weeks. You know, yeah. you have to. Yeah. So you took the 343 and the 434 and you saw that you could do that with the 252 and the 525. Um, well, I'd done the 525 two and 525 before. I didn't really know much about the 343 until after. Okay. Okay. So so it just happened to be a coincidence that we both had divided them in this sort of way, you're saying? Well, yeah, I wasn't. Okay. Um, I think it was yourself who done it. I wasn't really... And uh, it was more than two five two. I was noticing. Okay, okay. So it's kind of interesting that we have this, and we also have, of course, um, the one sixty one and the six one six as another division um, of the seven seven seven. So, okay. So I just wanted to clarify that point. So, so we have this that comes from the story of Joseph but it's also connected to the 70 weeks. Um, and, and so this 777 days, the argument that I'm making is that at the end of the 18 years, that is September 11th, 2019, um, we're going to be addressing now this 777 structure. So, so we're going to be addressing that. And we're going to be entering into it on November 11th, 2019. So um, two months after the anniversary of 9-11. And then this movement is being corrected by this 777 structure. That is, the purpose of these prophecies, these dates, was internal within this movement to correct us from the influences of false worship. Here would be a false system of studying or understanding God's word, right? It would also be, of course, relating to our characters, our systems, our methods of how we deal with one another. So this worship of the false gods has this symbol that, addresses the errors that exist within this movement. Would we agree with that? But that's the purpose of the 777 structure. So far, yeah. Okay. And, and if we understand that point, it, it's, it's an important point because we looked at it as something that was going to vindicate us. Um, but really, really, it was something meant to correct us. And, and this goes back to my original argument back in 2018 regarding time setting. So even before I knew that Parminder was in, in error, I mean, I knew that he was using the wrong arguments for time setting because I didn't accept that. And, and I didn't even know that he was going to attack the spirit of prophecy later on in the way that he did with dispensationalism. But I saw clearly that we couldn't reject what Ellen White said about time setting. That is, we couldn't say, well, Ellen White's words don't apply. We, I still, back in 2018, um, wrote a paper where I was very, very clear that this is a special case and that this was something meant to... Um, correct this movement. I didn't fully understand all the things that it meant, but this was something that we had gotten into because of Parminder um, back in 2012. That is, we, 
entered into this time setting. And so God used the time setting to correct us. Because time was already a part of our movement. God was using time as a witness for us internally uh, to know that we were being directed by God. So this was something meant to, to help us, to aid us. But it wasn't meant to predict external events. External events have witnessed to our lives, but we've never predicted those events. All the external events that have occurred are, are not something we predicted, but we can see that they do relate to our lives. And, and those lines are internal. So with the story of Jephthah, we would have to see that this relates to um, the end of these 18 years when Jephthah is raised up. Now, to understand when we get into chapter 11 and 12 exactly what that means and how we put that on a line, uh, that is another point. Now, the other thing about the 18 years is if we count the 18 years as prophetic time, it's going to bring us to one one year to the day after time setting is introduced into this movement. So if we count from September 11th, 2001, whatever it is, uh, 6,480 or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So it's just, somebody came on. Anyway, um, 6,000, I think it's 6,480 uh, days. It will bring us to June 9th, um, uh, 2019. And so that's going to be one year to the day after. Right. So that is, yes, 6,480 days from September 11th, 2001. So we can see then that this is about the time setting aspect, that the story of Jephthah is relating to that, that aspect of this movement. Does that make sense to people? Now, now, why is it one year after? Why does the, why do we have time setting introduced on June 9th, 2018, but the 18 years in prophetic time goes to one year after? What would be the reason for that? Does anybody know what, what symbolically that represents, this one year after? Passover. We've we've had this that one year thing about Passover. Uh, I can't remember exactly what it was, but we were talking about it a couple of days ago. Well, we had the one one month after. With Passover, I mean the only thing about the one year after is you have the original Exodus Passover, and then you have Passover a year later, and then you don't have a Passover for the next 38 years, right? And then you have a Passover again um, at the end of the 40 years. Okay, so, so that's not right. What were you thinking? Well, we've had this happen again and again in these lines. We will have the one year anniversary of an event marked symbolically. And this actually happened way back in 2018. Um, so a good example of this would be um, uh, the Thanksgiving Day prediction. So we have it in 2018. We make this prediction regarding November 22nd. But November 22nd um, uh, becomes a symbol, right? Well, it's a symbol already, but we will see that other thanksgivings also have become part of the structure, sometimes a year later, sometimes not, sometimes other periods of time. So, so we have these dates show up as a symbolic part of the structure, and I don't know what to call them, whether to call them an echo or a reminder is maybe a better way of looking at it. Because anniversaries are reminders, are they? Are they not? Yes. Okay. So, so bringing that that 
date, June 9th, 2019, even though we don't mark anything on it, it is a reminder of the time setting when it began. And so it fits into the structure. Now it's also going to be, you know, one year later. So one year is a symbol, uh, just from the simple ideas, a day for a year. Um, so I think it's significant when we when we look at what's this 18 years that it can be counted two different ways. And that also then ties this September 11th date with the June 9th date as a symbol. So there's, there's more to it. I mean, we could start looking at all these different lines and looking at all these different anniversaries. <clears throat> so anyway, at the end of these 18 years, we're going to have um, this, this battle, right? Um, so it says more of the children of Ammon passed over Jordan, verse nine, to fight against also, fight also against Judah and against Benjamin and against the house of Ephraim, so that Israel was sore distressed. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, saying, We have sinned against thee, both because we have forsaken our God and also served Balaam. And the Lord said unto the children of Israel, Did not I deliver you from the Egyptians, from the Amorites, from the children of Ammon, and from the Philistines, and from the Zidonians, and the Amalekites? And the Minoites. So here we have how many different nations that they've been delivered from? Five. Okay. Um, Egyptians, Amorites, Ammon, Philistines, Zizonians, Amalekites, um, and Minoites. That's seven. 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 Sorry. Okay. So we have seven. So again, we have seven being represented. Um, and um, so, so this is, of course, a perfect deliverance, right? They have been delivered. Um, and, and God delivered them, right? So, so they have this memory of the past. So this is a reminder, again, that God has already worked for them. He says, yet ye have forsaken me and served other gods, wherefore I will deliver you no more. Go and cry unto the gods which ye have chosen. Let them deliver you in the time of your tribulation. And the children of Israel said unto the Lord, we have sinned. Do thou unto us whatsoever seemeth good unto thee. Deliver us only, we pray thee, this day. And they put the strange gods from among them and served the Lord. And his soul was grieved for the misery of Israel. So there is a repentance that occurs here. Right? That's what it sounds like. Mm -hmm. Then the children of Ammon were gathered together and encamped in Gilead, and the children of Israel assembled themselves together and encamped in Mizpah. And the people and princes of Gilead said one to another, What man is he that will begin to fight against the children of Ammon? And he shall be the head over all the inhabitants of Gilead. Right. So now they're going to appeal to Jephthah, which we had already started on. So just to, to get us back here on track, you can see that in the story of Jephthah, uh, he's the son of a harlot, right? And um, he's then outcast, he's thrust out. But then when this uh, war occurs, it came to pass in process of time that the children of Ammon made war against Israel. And it was so that when the children of Ammon made war against Israel, the elders of Gilead went to fetch Jephthah out of the land of Tob, so this good land. And they said unto Jephthah, come and be our captain that we may fight with the children of Ammon. And Jephthah said unto the elders of Gilead, did not ye hate me and expel me out of my father's house? And why are ye come unto me now when ye are in distress? And the elders of Gilead said unto Jephthah, therefore we turn again to thee now that thou mayest go with us and fight against the children of Ammon and be our head over all the inhabitants of Gilead. And Jephthah said unto um, the elders of Gilead, if ye bring me home again to fight against the children of Ammon, and the Lord deliver them before me, shall I be your head? 
And the elders of Gilead said unto Jephthah, The Lord be witness between us, if we do not so according to thy words. Then Jephthah went with the elders of Gilead, and the people made him head and captain over them. And Jephthah uttered all his words before the Lord in Mizpah. And Jephthah sent messengers unto the king of the children of Ammon, saying, What is it that thou hast to do with me, that thou art come against me to fight in my land? So the whole idea here is Jephthah is a message. And, and this is a message that was cast out and is now being accepted. And we're saying that this is the message of July 18 again, right? Yeah, that's been our conclusion. Okay. Now, based on the context and what we reviewed to it, but it also includes November 9th and December 25th, 2021. Would, would we agree with that? Because of the symbols of the sevens. That was the seven, 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 right? Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's dealing with this message as well. So this is something that's meant to uh, correct this movement. Did you say September 25th? December 25th. Oh, December. Okay, December. December. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so December 25th, 2021, the end of the 777 uh, day, days. Also, it's the end of the whole 777 chiasm, but that's a whole other story. Um, so here we have um, this message that's going to be called and and it's called because of what happens with Parminder to some degree, right? So Parminder is not really mentioned here, but just in our history, we have the message of Parminder, which is a papal message. And it's going to be at the end of that period, that 18 years from 2001 in 2019, that Parminder is going to be exposed. And this message that had been cast out is now going to be called back. Yeah, that was by Jeff. He started yeah. uh, expounding on it. Right, and, and it, it doesn't happen right away. It's not like the first day. He's gonna first uh, deal with these uh, the media issue. But very soon after that, Jeff is going to be getting into the whole issues of July 18th. That's gonna come into this movement. And now part of that has to do with the understanding of November 9th. The idea was that this was um, uh, the priests of Baal on Mount Carmel. Um, and that was their failed attempt. And that July 18th was going to be Elijah on Mount Carmel. Correct? Yeah, that's what we had uh, agreed with. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, was Jeff correct? I don't think he was completely correct. Okay, it wasn't completely correct. That is, what he expected to be the witness uh, didn't occur. But is July 18th still fulfill that role? Um, yeah, yes. Okay, right because it's going to be a dividing line. So when, you know, when we look, when we compare it with October 22, 1844, I mean, we can definitely see that July 18th fulfills that role, but we are in a typical line. We shouldn't have expected it, it, um, external events. And we also had God giving a testimony that we shouldn't be expecting. Um, external events. Now, um, other points that we had brought up that we could uh, we no note again, um, because part of part of this is we know it's this this elders of Gilead who. Um, call him, right? And 
and we were we were discussing basically how do how do we understand this elders of Gilead? Because this is an important point if we're going to place this on a line. So Jephthah's a Gileadite, um, and his dad's name is Gilead, right? Yes. Okay. So, so we have to make a distinction between these two. So he's a, he's his dad is Gilead, and he's a Gileadite. This message comes from Gilead, which is a, Manasseh is in Gilead, right? That's what we understand. That's what we determined. Yep. Yeah. Uh, but he's the son of a harlot. That is, he's illegitimate. Um, now, how does that relate, though, to this message of July 18th? In what way is July 18th illegitimate, that message of July 18th? Um, the things that we attach to it. Okay, explain. Well, um, you know, we threw in the the Ishmaelites, the nuclear perspective. Um, well, the I wouldn't destruction of Nashville. Yeah, but I don't think those things are illegitimate. That's not what. Well, I, mean. I don't. They 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 are too probably happen in the future. I mean, we right. know that we know that. Uh, Ellen White uh, had made that uh, prediction. We right. just don't exactly know when it's going to happen, but we probably mm -hmm. have an idea of when it's going to happen. So I wouldn't make that July 18th illegitimate. I, I would say that its origin is what makes it illegitimate. Well, that's a good perspective. And, and um, You know, so so I, I mean, I sort of take this personally in that sense, in, in that it has to do with who I am as a person and where the message comes from. That is, I'm on the outside of things. As much as people may think that I was involved with School of the Prophets, I mean, even when I was there in 2018, I wasn't there as part of the staff, I wasn't even really a student. I'm not really sure why we were there. Um, and, and yet, you know, we ended up to the chagrin of some of the people there um, being involved in, in this prediction, right? And it wasn't just to Parminder and Tess that uh, didn't want us there. I mean, there was other people that didn't want us there that were part of it. So the message of July 18th comes from an illegitimate source as far as the movement is concerned. And that would be you? That would be me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, okay, I, I agree with that. Yeah, so, cause I'm the one who came up with July 18th. Now it does come from our movement that is Jeff recognized that, that it was right. just a result of everything that we had studied, but there was so much resistance to July 18th. Um, you know, if Jeff hadn't accepted it, it would never have been accepted by the movement. But Jeff accepted it. And then and then he had to put it on the back burner. I don't think he ever completely rejected it, which is why he revived it again after Parminder was gone. But um, I'm not the one who's really promoting it in the movement, right? Yeah, I'm, you just found it. I found it, shared it with Jeff. Um, and I did some sharing at the School of the Prophets in 2018. Um, but we know that when uh, the time came uh, for Jeff to present the message, I'm not the one presenting it. No, you were not. Right. So, so that's what I'm saying is that even I in, agree with that perspective. So we, yeah. So even in the whole time here, it's that's what I would say. The it's the origin of the message which is why it's initially rejected. And yet they're going to make this the primary message of the movement. Right? Oh, man. 
it does so, parallel this. Yeah. It is paralleling. Yeah. So, yeah. So, you know, so when I look at this whole thing, that just that message of July 18th um, is is what's being represented by the story of Jephthah. It makes perfect sense. Yeah. So, um, and, and even then they're still reluctant, um, you know, as we see, uh, to make Jephthah their head. I mean, I mean, here they're going to be accepting Jephthah back, but. Which is the message, which is the July 18th message. Yes, it's the message, yeah. It's not a person. No, it's not a person, but but it's the origins in, in our history comes from a le- illegitimate source, which would be me, right? Yeah. Okay. So so maybe I'm the harlot in this in this context, <laughs> right? That's not meant as a joke. I'm just saying as no, I know, I know. I just I think I'm thinking message. of yeah. uh, Samson's story. Yeah. You know, ironic. Yeah. Yeah, so so we have this son of a harlot. This Jephthah is the son of a harlot. So the message of July 18th comes from this illegitimate source, right? right? But also Gilead begat Jephthah. So there is a sense in which we would have to understand what Gilead is um, as a person compared to the Gileadite, uh, the Gileadites or the elders of Gilead, right? So there's a distinction there. That's why I'm going through this whole whole thing. So Gilead is is what? Would we consider it another message? Um, No. Because it's- Okay, what's your thought? It's a place, right? Well, I mean, it's a person here, but it's also a place. So we know that Gilead means a rocky region. Right. Um, it's related right, to the, right. it means a heap of testimony. Right. So it's related to the idea of a heap of testimony. Is that where the uh, Gilead, was that where they had uh, took the rocks that they pulled out of the where was that? Um, well, um, so it's, yeah, it's that cairn, the memorial cairn east of the Jordan. Yeah. So, so would that be where they placed those heat, that heat? Is that where they got that name? Yeah. yeah. So, so could this be that Gilead represents the messages that have come to the movement prior to 2018. It would be consistent. Okay. So this would be the messages that Jeff had had the foundation that Jeff had laid, these stones that he had brought up out of the Jordan, so to speak. Yeah, it it sounds it sounds like it works. Yeah. It, okay. it, it sounds anyone, like it is parallel. Yeah. So anyone else on this? Do we, do we see that Gilead represents the messages of Jeff? That this is what begets July 18th, even though it comes from an illegitimate source. So the elders of Gilead would be those that are connected with FFA. That's not, what I would say. Not necessarily as persons individually, but as um, FFA does make this uh, agreement with. Yeah, to, collectively. Yeah. Okay. So it's not referring to a person per se, but it is uh, referring to FFA. So we can say that Gilead is basically the messages of Jeff, that the messages of FFA, but the people of FFA are going to be the elders of Gilead, the organizational structure, the civil power, so to speak.
Any anybody disagree with this idea or have questions about it? It seems to be that way. It's translating to. Yeah. Okay. Anybody have a disagreement? Anybody see problems or questions? Now, um, now Judges 11.4, where it says it came to pass in process of time. Now, in process of time, I dislike that translation of the Hebrew, but they use it um, um, occasionally. Uh, because the word there is literally, if we're going to translate, I don't see what Young's does with it. Now, it says after a time, but really the word there is day. And um, or days. So the way that it's literally uh, should be translated. If I if I go over here, um, it's it's mim yom. So what they're doing is they're putting this word mim as a uh, a prefix to the word yom, which means day. And so. Even in here, you can see it's going to use uh, this word yom, just has 3117, the Strong's number. Uh, and it says mim yom in, in Hebrew. Um, and if we go to the King James here, you'll see that they, uh, they actually put two numbers here, uh, 4480, uh, which is min. And then they put the word yom. So this word mim means um, basically from. Uh, so it came to pass from the days that the children of Ammon made war against Israel. Now, why am I, you know, focusing upon this um, this symbol here? Why, why would I be interested it's Mim Yom? Can we take this as an application to the 777 structure? I would think we have to. Okay. So, and, and that's why to me, I like focusing upon the days from the days. Uh, it came to pass from the days that the children of Ammon made war against Israel. So there's a battle going on in methodology, in how we, how we understand uh, scripture, how we understand prophecy, how we understand symbols that's going on within this movement over this 777 structure? Um, I, I kind of noticed something. Okay. Uh, one of those references was uh, 480 something. 4480, yeah. I'm sorry, what was it again, please? 4480. 4480. Yeah. I'm sorry, I just seen the 480, Yeah. Um, which connected us to the 2520. Okay. I'm sorry. I, that's okay. I, yep, that's fine. Well, and, and each of these you have four fours. You know, there's four fours in this phrase, four, four, eight, zero, six, four, four, zero, whatever that means. Um, but anyway, um, so we have in the process of time, oh, wait, pardon me, that's, I'm looking at the wrong ones because that's from his brethren. Uh, so we got, yeah, 3117 and 4480 is that phrase. So Judges 11.4 is also 411 backwards. And what's 411 in North America, at least? Information. Information, right? Okay. So, um, so this is information. This is a message um, regarding time. 
that the children of Israel are going to, or the children of Ammon are going to make war against the children of Israel. And we can see that that's what, what happens at the beginning of this period. And it was so when the children of Ammon made war against Israel, the elders of Gilead went to fetch Jephthah out of the land of Tob. So the elders of Gilead would represent FFA or this movement, right? Yes. It's going gonna, it's gonna to take this message <coughs> of July 18th in this battle with these, uh, the children of Ammon, which is partly, you know, representing uh, the methods and the understanding of Parminder's movement. Because that's when July 18th comes into play, is in this conflict. And it's going to become our main uh, weapon, right? The July 18th is going to become our prediction. This is Elijah going against the priests of Baal. That's what we had studied. Yeah. So they said unto Jeff to come and be our captain, right? So they're going to want to make him the leader, but it, it happens in steps. First captain, right? Then head. head and captain right that he's going to be made so so they're they're tentative tentatively uh wanting him to be involved in this battle but they're not fully committed to this So in verse 11, so 11, 11, then Jephthah went with the elders of Gilead and the people made him head and captain over them. And Jephthah uttered all the words before the Lord in Mizpah. And Jephthah sent messengers unto the king of the children of Ammon, saying, what hast thou to do with me that thou art come against me to fight in my land? And the king of the children of Ammon answered unto the messengers of Jephthah, because Israel took away my land when they came up out of Egypt from Arnon, even unto Jabbok and unto the Jordan. Now, therefore, restore those lands again peaceably. And Jephthah sent messengers again unto the king of the children of Ammon and said unto him, Thus saith Jephthah, Israel took not away the land of Moab, nor the land of the children of Ammon. But when Israel came up from Egypt and walked through the wilderness unto the Red Sea and came to Kadesh, then Israel sent messengers unto the king of Edom saying, let me, I pray thee, pass through thy land. But the king of Edom would not hearken thereto. And in like manner they sent unto the king of Moab, but he would not consent, and Israel abode in Kadesh. Then they went along through the wilderness, encompassed the land of Edom and the land of Moab, and came by the east side of the land of Moab, and pitched on the other side of Arnon, but came not within the border of Moab, for Arnon was the border of Moab. And Israel sent messengers um, unto Sihon, king of the Amorites, the king of Heshbon. And Israel said unto him, let us pass, we pray thee, through thy land into this place. But Sihon trusted not Israel to pass through his coast, but Sihon gathered all his people together and pitched in Jahaz and fought against Israel. And the Lord God of Israel delivered Sihon and all his people into the hand of Israel, and they smote them. So Israel possessed all the country of the Amorites, the inhabitants of that country. And they possessed even unto the coast of the Amorites from Arnon, even unto Jabbok, and from the wilderness, even unto Jordan. So now the Lord God of Israel hath dispossessed the Amorites from before his people Israel. And shouldest thou possess it? Wilt thou possess that which Chemosh thy God giveth thee to possess? So whomsoever the Lord our God shall drive out from before us, them we will possess. And now art thou anything better than Balak, the son of Zippor, the king of Moab? And did he ever strive against Israel or did he ever fight against him? So before we go on, we went through this already. So what is uh, this story? What is it that the king of the Amorites is saying? And what is uh, Jephthah's response? Well, uh, they were saying that you need to give him back his lands that um, 
that they took from them or they unlawfully possessed. Okay. But Jeff has said that it was God that gave them the land in the first place. So what's up? Paraphrasing. Okay. Well, there's a little bit more to it than that. Okay. Dwight, Dwight you had dealt with this before. How did, how did you understand this? And we looked at this, that they wanted Jephthah to return to the understandings of the incorrect way of studying. Okay. So, so specifically, I mean, when we look at the situation, because Ron sort of summed it up a bit, but there's some details. Right that are missing or some points that are missing um, in Jephthah's response. Right. So what, what's missing there? That leads to your conclusions. Just a second. Because the king of uh, the Amorites is making a false claim, right? We have that's what we thought. Right. But we have the children of Ammon. You mean the king of Ammon is making a false claim? Yeah, the king of Ammon. Right. Right. Yeah, it's it's not the Amorites, it's the Ammonites. I know. It's the Ammonites, yes. So the king of Ammon is making a false claim about the Amorites. Right, because the king of Ammon, how, how would we describe this? What is his claim? Okay, so Jephthah sent the messengers to the king of, of the children of Ammon. Right. And said, yeah. un, and said unto him, thus saith Jephthah, Israel took not away the land of Moab, nor the land of the children of Ammon. Right, so he didn't take away the Moabite land and the Ammonite land. Right. But he took away uh, the Amorites land. When Israel came up from Egypt and walked through the wilderness under the Red Sea and came to Kadesh. Right. Israel sent messengers to the king of Edom. Let me, let me, I pray thee, pass through thy land. So he was sending this message to those relatives. Yeah to say, let us pass through, but the king of Edom would not hearken. Mm -hmm. And in a like manner, they sent unto the king of Moab, but he would not consent, and Israel abode in Kadesh. Mm -hmm. When they went through the wilderness, they compassed or, went, or walked beside the land of Edom and the land of Moab and came to the east side of the land of Moab and pitched on the other side of Arnon, but came not within the border of Moab, for Arnon was the border of Moab. Right. So then they're going to conquer, um, like Sihon, king of the Amorites. Right. Right. So, so the land of the Amorites, the Moabites and uh, the Ammonites have no claim over it. Correct. Okay. So that's what I thought. So I'm just making clear. So now then that means um, um, if we're going to make an application of this, as you, you, as you were saying, that this has to do with uh, an illegitimate claim here, I guess, um, regarding the message that, um, that is being sent by that, that comes from an understanding of July 18th. Yeah, it's a, it's a false message of the understanding of July 18th. Right. And, and a false message of, of time setting and all these different points. Exactly. That came into this movement. So now uh, this is going to be corrected by Jephthah. Because Correct. these claims being made because of these worship of these false gods, they have these enemies come in. And... Um, you know, we could look at this enemy here as being Parminder's movement, 
but it's something more. It's actually something that has uh, affected the movement completely. But um, because of the first worship, the false systems of study allow us to uh, to have this message of Parminder come in. And so this conflict between Parminder's message and the message that Jeff had been giving are, are what we're going to see. And, and it's going to now be um, Jeff's message really is now going to be personified as Jephthah, right? That is the message of July 18th is the message of Jeff. It was considered illegitimate because of its source, but it still comes from Jeff, from his studies, from his message. Right. Okay. And, and this is not something that, that was really embraced by a lot of people in the movement, which I would call the elders of Gilead. Um, in, in calling the July 18th message in to fight against Parminder's message, um, they had an aversion to Parminder's message for the wrong reasons. Does right. That make sense, right. So, so they never really fully embrace uh, the message of July 18th, even though they call it in. But this is the elders of Gilead. This is not, um, and, and, and Jeff would be included in that in the sense that this is FFA. But, but the message of July 18th is um, engendered by Jeff's messages, that it's the result of that. It's not some strange message that comes in, even though it's considered illegitimate because of one part of its source. Uh, but the other part makes it legitimate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, so he rehearses this history, and then he's going to um, bring us to the story of Balaam. Right. Well, here he's going to talk about, um, and now art thou anything better than Balak, the son of Zippor, the king of Moab? Did he ever strive against Israel or did he ever fight against them? So doesn't mention Balaam he here specifically, but in the story of Balaam, the, uh, Balak, this is about the story of Balaam, right? Right. Yeah. So he doesn't fight against them. All he does is try to get Israel cursed. So, so, why, so why is this brought up? if we're going to make an application to our history. Isn't he in this make, trying to make use and say that you are making a claim or you're, you're presenting a message that is one that failed in the past because didn't Balak fail in, his, in their battles against Israel? Yeah, well, they never really battled against them. They cursed them. Right. Um, and, and it was bringing the Moabitish woman into the camp. Now, now, we can also connect that to Parminder as well, right? I would agree. So Parminder doesn't fight, in a sense, against uh, Israel, right? Parminder uses deceit, deception. Like, like Balaam. Yes, and we know that Jeff is going to awaken, and the rebellion at Baal Peor, that is Jeff awakening there on September 7th, 2019. Very much like Moses awakened. Yes, and, and so we've already made that parallel a long time ago. Um, 
in understanding that story. So it's brought up here. So again, it brings us back to that history at the end of the 18 years, right? Well, so it's just more witness that we're correct in how we're doing this. Okay, Dwight. Okay, but if we're looking a little further, while Israel dwelt in Heshbon and her towns and in Aurora and her towns, and in all the cities that be along the coasts of Arnon, 300 years. Mm -hmm. Why therefore did ye not recover them within that time? Now, if they're, if they're speaking of about 300 years, what if this was actually 301 years and we took away the 18 and we come down to 273? Yeah, I don't know if I would do that. I mean, I okay. think the much clearer thing about the 300 years. Okay, what is that? Well, that's one of the things we're going to actually have to study is we're going to have to study out these 300 years. All right. How they apply in the story of the judges themselves and, and how we then apply that to our movement. Would there have been 300 years from the time of Moses to this time in the time of the judges. Okay, so Stephen, can you fill us in on the 300 years, what you understand about it? Because there's two periods of 300 years. Yeah, so I, um, I take it from 1494 BC, that's when the uh, sort of just before the, like the 39th year that they were in the wilderness and they're just coming into a promised land. They haven't crossed the Jordan yet. Mm -hmm. So they take, uh, they take uh, the land of the Amorites, they defeat Sihon and they defeat Og. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm taking this as probably around the end of that year. And so uh, I just would count 300 years from then. So that would take you to 1194 BC. Okay, so, so that's this period of 300 years. Now we know there's another period of 300 years and that period of 300 years refers to... Right, that's from the setting up of the tabernacle at Shiloh. Yeah. So I take that, that would be like seven years after 300, these 300 years begin. Yeah, and that's Ellen White. Yes, and she connects it to the time when um, Eli dies and his sons are killed and the Ark is taken by the Philistines. Yeah, so it's 300 years that the Ark is in Shiloh. Yes. Okay, so we have two aspects of 300 years here. So... Um, so when it talks about the 300 years, what 300 years is it referring to? I mean, here it's obviously referring to the 300 years uh, there, but we have Ellen White talk about 300 years and how would we connect them to what happens with the symbols that are attached to them? So one deals with the Ark in Shiloh, um, which is not the one being mentioned here, but I think they're important that they're both 300 years. And this one is mentioning basically the 300 years from when um, uh, uh, they defeat the Amorites. Uh, the Amorites, right? And you got Sihon, right, uh, is defeated. So that's from, the, the from what Stephen was presenting. I would have to almost think that it'd be the first one not the second. Yeah, well, it is the first one, but I'm just saying that that as a symbol, these two pe periods of 300 years come together. So right. One, they're offset by seven years. They're offset by the seven times. Right, okay. So, so they're connected with the seven times, right, with that symbol. So... So we can bring them together as part of a structure.
and then and then we have to say well they they represent two different things that come together um so so we don't just ignore the other 300 years so if the ark is in shiloh what does that refer to how would we apply that to this movement that the ark being in shiloh for 300 years so Remember, there, this, this is not the 300 years that's being mentioned here, but they are connected. So how can we connect the ark being in Shiloh to this movement? Well, I have a saying that uh, said, it is an ark can saw where the ark can be saw. <laughs> so uh, That's so pretty good, <laughs> Stephen. I like that. No, it was... Uh, they find, you know, you had uh, the, uh, you know, you have maybe like California would be CA and also Missouri would be MO or so it's, uh, Arkansas was ARK. Oh, yeah. I thought it was sort of, sort of shortened to the arc. To arc. Okay. Oh, well, that's interesting. Um, so, so we know that, in a sense, then the Ark moves from Arkansas. Right? That's when it's in Shiloh? Is that what you're saying? Yes. Okay. So this, I mean, even though I wasn't thinking of that, that fits in with what, what I'm saying. It's that there is this seven-year period, and would the seven years represent the 777 structure? That could. Yeah, it, it, it is a sign of completeness, right? Okay, so so because we're already connecting these things, right? We're already connecting this with the beginning of this 777 structure, right? right to that, that period of history where um, prior to 9-11, you know, this battle ensues. And, and it really ends at 9-11. That's the close of probation for Parminder's movement. Right, so that's going to start the 777 days, and and so it's at the that the beginning of that that we have 300 years that are these 300 years from the time that something occurs. So we, we'd have to try to connect the beginning of this history, but we're going to at least recognize that the end of that 300 years is gonna be at the start of the 777 structure. And that the other 300 years of the art being in Shiloh and moving from Shiloh to, um, where does it move from? Is gonna be- That goes to, yeah, the Philistines, the Ekron and Gaza. Yeah, so it's, it's gonna be moved around a bit and then finally settles in, um, What's the place it settles in? Is it uh, Kyrgyz Jerem, I think? Yeah, Kyrgyz Jerem, I think, is what it is. And, and then it'll be later on moved to Jerusalem, right, by, by David. Okay, so... <clears throat> So we know that it, it's it's not just a straightforward thing. It doesn't just go from Shiloh to Jerusalem. There's going to be this uh, transition period. Um, and, and I haven't figured out exactly what that means yet. But what we, what we can say here is that, so we have the beginning of the, the, the 777 days being marked here. Now, so when would they have begun? What event in our movement would mark the beginning of the time that the Ark is in Arkansas? Would that be when the School of the Prophets opened up? Just a guess. Yeah, well, you know, that might be it. I mean, 
We could go back to maybe 2011 uh, when Jeff receives the $165,000 to start the School of Profits, or we could go to 2014 um, when they have the first camp meeting. Um, but we have to go back to some event that we could mark. Um, now well, it's the, 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 art, the art. Yep. Yeah, the yeah. earliest, I think, maybe 2004 with the ozone. Yeah, and, then, and that's what I was going to go with. I was going to go to 2004 with the ozone. Um, so that's in Arkansas. It, now, they didn't move the School of the Prophets there yet. Right. They didn't move. You know, I don't I'm not sure when Jeff's ministry actually moved to Arkansas. I used to know. Um, it's it's going to be sometime after that, though. Right. Because I remember him talking about it. Um, so I don't know when they actually bought the property there that he lives on. But let's say it's 2004 and that becomes significant. Uh, why does that become significant in the context of the 777 structure? Is that the introduction of the seven times? Or at least partly in 2004? Well, the seven times are normally connected to 2005. Right. But he actually started to study them in 2004, did he not? In that we have the chart uh, being studied. Because when we looked at examining the foundation, they really start to look at the chart more in 2004. Now, did he? Well, he Go ahead, yeah. Steve. Yeah, he was using the charts just to prove the daily was paganism. Right. Prior to that. Yeah, and, and he does start reading um, um, in 2004. I think he's looking at um, Josiah Litch's, or not Josiah Litch's, um, Hiram Edson's articles. But it's not going to be until 2005 that he puts that together and presents it in January or something. I thought the major support of that came from Dwayne Dewey. Right. Yeah, it does. But Dwayne Dewey introduced Jeff first to Hiram Edson's articles. Okay. Which, which then leads Jeff to see the 2520 and then to start to put that together. So, but we, we, we can at least, you know, 2004 is a pivotal year in the movement. And it can connect us to Arkansas. So, um, you know, maybe we could look at the dates of those meetings and, and try to figure out some kind of span of time that relates to the 300. Um, I don't know. But we have the, the main point I see about the 300 is, is the symbol of the three, but also the connection with the other 300 that Ellen White mentions so that we have these two periods of 300 years that tie us together. Um, and, and we can now connect this with the arc moving to Arkansas and then the arc um, moving from Arkansas at the end of the 777 days, right? So you got that 300 is marking this period, the, this 300 here is marking this battle that's going to begin at the beginning of the 777 days. And then the other 300 is, is going to be about the arc. So if we're going to have the battle, though, so we're dealing with the arc, would we put, we would we put the beginning of this 300 years as 2001? Right, because this 300 years is not about the ark, right? This one here is about um, the Israelites defeating the Amorites. And can we place that at 2001? That means we're taking the 18 years 
and these 300 years, and we're using them not literally, but just as symbols, uh, that this is going to bring us back as a symbol, a different symbol, but to something that's still going to line up with 9-11, just like the 18 years does. Would that make sense? Or are we going to take these 300 years and bring them back to 1989? That's the other option. But because that's going to be at the beginning of the 40 years. So we're near the beginning of the 40 years. That's 89, right? At the end, the end of the 40 years, pardon me. Yeah, so I don't know. I don't know if we would go 1989 and take these 300 years and bring them back to there, or these 300 years start at 9-11. I would prefer 9-11. Um, that would make more sense to me. It's at the end of the 40 years that you're going to have this in the 39th year. People understand what I'm trying to do here. I'm just taking these symbols, not literally, I'm not addressing the time element, but just as a symbol, it would make more sense to bring this to 9-11. And especially in how we're understanding judges. But, but we could make an argument that 1989 is reaching back further, but, but we already have the other 300 years beginning in 2004 and ending, then that means they would end at the end of the 777 structure. It's gonna bring us to our history. So the arc is going to move from Shiloh and exactly where, I mean, I don't think it's going to be on uh, December 25th, 2021. I think that's actually gonna happen as FFA ends up um, a dismantling. So what were the circumstances of the Ark leaving Shiloh? Well, it's going to be taken uh, by the Philistines, right? So, well, I thought it was uh, the two young men, Eli's boys, yeah. put that thing in front of a, yeah. the army, and that's that's when the Philistines took it. And really, did the Philistines actually take it or did it wander off in a cart? No, they took it. Okay. And then it wanders back because of all the curses that happened. So they, they send it back. That's right. That's and, right. Uh, yeah. So, so I think this is a really important point um, to try to address uh, how the arc ends up moving from Arkansas, that it is, in a sense, captured by the Philistines. So that would be in some way that the message is taken over. Um, Could that be the Parminder thing? No, no, Parminder's at the beginning of that. Oh, okay. Right. So, I mean... Well, you know, maybe, I mean, I'm trying to put this at the end of the 777 structure, but maybe we can put them both at, we can just line them up and have them both address this. But um, I don't think, you know, okay, the, the Ark is captured by the Philistines, right? So it doesn't just go directly uh, to Jerusalem. Now, how long is it from the time that the Ark's captured um, until until it's released, until it comes back to Israel. I'm not sure, Stephen. Yeah, I think it's seven months. Yeah, seven months. So maybe we could take the seven months as represent as parallel with the seven years, with the seven mm -hmm. seven, seven structure. So that the ark is captured at, at the same time here that we're talking about, right? The three hundred years representing the ark being captured is not not directly related here. This is the other three hundred years, but we can put those together and use that seven months to also represent the set represent the seven 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 structure, and. So that the Ark being captured would be when Parminder's movement takes over 
or seeks to take over FFA, right? They want to have the School of Prophets. They want to have Lambert Church. Now, they don't really get it, um, but they do sort of temporarily uh, possess it, don't they? No. Well, depends what you mean by no. I mean, he's given the leadership of the movement for a time. But they had they had this arrangement where Bronwyn was supposed to continue to manage one portion and they were going to have Larry Hine managing the property. Yeah, but I'm not talking about the property itself. I'm talking about the ark. Right. What is the ark representing? The power of God. The message and the understanding of the message. Right. So the Parminder takes this over. He doesn't get the school of the prophets. He doesn't get, you know, the organization as such. But he now seems to have taken over the message. And people are going to be following him for a while. Not everyone. But, but this has happened, you know. So once Parminder is given the, the leadership, you know, Jeff, Jeff retires. So Jeff is going to awaken and then uh, respond, right? Now, um, you know, and I, I usually mark uh, April, April 8th for Jeff's retirement. Um, and then he awakens on September 7th. Stephen, you have some thoughts? Or is somebody? April 8th, what? year uh 2019 so jeff has the camp meeting where he passes the torch or the cloak or whatever it is to parminder and then he just steps aside right he retires and he comes out of retire on september 7th 2019 so so it's going to be five months right that he's in hiding. Yeah. Stephen, did you have a thought? Um, yeah, I think it was his last, what was his, his last presentation was called, or one of his last was 2019 and 2021. 20, was that was just a title, I think, of his last presentation. I don't know if that could factor in, because okay. in that there you have, like, uh, he doesn't specify any particular dates, but you have there, I just think of it as sort of connects with the 777, just with the end and okay. an ending of it. Okay, so I think that's important in his last presentation, that he's going to address 2019 and 2021. But even though he's not addressing the 777 structure, because we don't have that in his mind yet, right? Uh, because they were looking at, Parminder's movement was looking at 2019 and then 2021. Yes, and it was that presentation that made me think, well, I was sort of thinking, well, July 18, maybe, maybe there's no, maybe it's going to be 2021. So I think, I was thinking, well, if there was a date in 2021, what would it be? And uh, it's 25th of December, just came into my mind. And then um, I sort of just checking it and then sort of uh, done a paper where I can maybe sort of see to bring in July 18 as well, connect it with 2021. Okay, so you're saying Jeff's last presentation is the one that led to the 777 understanding? Yes. Okay. So I think that's very significant here. So um so we're going to say so we might argue so and we're going to have to look at this again tomorrow i mean we could even argue that um you know that the ark is going to move it's going to be captured by the philistines when parminder uh takes over the movement and and that's going to be april 8th um the day after jeff's last presentation And this 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 presentation 
also led us into the understanding of the 777? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So it's... That's a significant date then. That needs to be laid on a line. A April 8th? Wouldn't you think? Well, that was the first date that I predicted in 2019 as the rebellion. Um, but that was Judas betraying Christ. Well, so now we've got a little extra uh, block that we stick on there that, and this happened as well. No, so that's, we can tie that's, this right what I, that's what, that's how I understood it was fulfilled. Was, was that date and Jeff's presentation? Well, not so much the presentation, his presentation is the day before, but his retirement but yeah, we can now attach the 777 because the Stephen used that last presentation. So we're marking the retirement of Jeff and um, and then the taking over the transition to Parminder being the leader of the movement, so-called. So but he's taking the arc, right? And he's moving it to the, you know, to the land of the Philistines. Right, right. The Philistines are captured. Yeah. I'm not too sure exactly. I'd have to start check to see if that was his last. It's certainly as near, nearly as last anyway. It was right that time. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's in there in that series of meetings, you're saying. But but we'll look at it. So we'll look at this tomorrow again. Stephen will check up some dates and so forth. Okay, so we're done for today. Um, can everyone join me in prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful uh, for the things that you've shown us here this morning. We do not deserve to have this light shining upon our path, but we ask, Lord, that you can give us the strength to walk in it. Um, we need your guidance and direction, and um, we need your strength. We pray for each one who's studying these things. Please continue to enlighten our minds and be with us in all that we do today, that we may reflect your character. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.